Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the Epiphany of our Lord comes from our Gospel reading of Matthew. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Let's follow the text. The wise men come searching for the king of the Jews, and so they search for him in the only place where such a king should be found in a palace in Jerusalem. That's where you go to find a king, after all, not in a common house in some off-the-beaten-path town like Bethlehem or Nazareth. No, you find a king where a king must reside, and so you find a king in the place of kings. A king should be found separated away from the commoner, away from the normal folk, away from all of those who are less than him. But that's not Jesus. And so he's rarely found acting like the sort of king we sinners expect him to be. When the wise men park their camels in front of the kingly palace in Jerusalem, Herod is a little taken aback. He hadn't expected such visitors and wasn't quite prepared for their proclamation of a new king being born. And besides all of that, why would Gentiles come to worship the king of the Jews? And maybe that right there should tell us a little bit about this Jesus king of ours. But such news was always there to be had for Herod if only he knew where to look for it. The prophets had long ago foretold of this birth, this king, this Jesus. Micah had even laid it out, that exact place. But the sinner never likes to turn to the scriptures to hear about the workings of God, especially when those workings have to do with their salvation. Herod isn't all that happy about hearing of this newly born king. For him, such news was troubling, and not just for him, all of Jerusalem too, because a new king can't be for him. A new king has to be against him. And in that way, Herod's no different than any other sinner, because the sinner never expects a king, a godly king, God in the flesh, to be for him. Isn't it weird that the sinner gets terrified when he hears about his godly king? Well, maybe it's not so weird. For what else can the sinner do? Because the sinner always expects that a king should be served. He thinks that a king is set in high places, and all those beneath him are set there to serve him hand and foot. A king reigns with might and power, with a sword in his hand. A king is there to punish. And the sinner's terrified to hear about his God coming to him. He would much rather this never happen. It's so much easier to think that we aren't quite the sinners that we know that we are deep down inside if we can just pretend that there's no one to be held accountable to. And so we do our best to do away with any notion of God as our king. And perhaps we don't go to the murderous lengths that Herod did, but come on, let's be honest with ourselves. If we could, we would. The sinner tries to silence any notion of God. We shut our ears to his word, hoping against hope that if we believe hard enough, then all of our wishes will come true, and God won't be our king, and we can go about our lives as we see fit. But the problem that the sinner has is that the sinner doesn't understand anything about our God, the one who is our king, the one who came into our flesh and dwelt among us. We have everything backwards in regards to his ways and to his workings. We hole ourselves up in our makeshift palaces, finding comfort in our own ways and in our own salvation. We don't need a king, we declare, for we are the masters of our own destiny. We need not worship this God of creation, not when we've convinced ourselves that we've made our own life what it is. Not when we've coronated ourselves, placed a crown on our own head, and decked ourselves with our own regal robes. Ironically, we find Herod fuming 
in his regal robe, sitting upon his royal throne, for he's sure that this little king is against him. And the scribes and the chief priests, they're in the same boat as well. And we see this 30 years later as the same group of religious elite can't fathom a Jesus who is their king. All they see is a man who threatens the things that they hold most dear, the things that they cling to the tightest. Power and prestige are bitter honey traps that usually corrupt more than they uplift. And so when anyone or anything comes along to threaten to tear down those false pillars of temporal or spiritual security, the only thing to do is to lash out. But Herod and the scribes, they had it all wrong. For Jesus was a king, and he was for them. He couldn't care less about a temporal kingdom of thrones and scepters and kingly crowns. The majesty of heaven is his already. What good are a few baubles to him? No, this Christ child was going to seek a different kingdom because he was going to be a different sort of king. Thorns were better fitted for his head than any jewel-encrusted crown. And his scepter was going to be a nail hammered through each hand. And for his throne, he would have nothing less than a couple wooden beams in the shape of a cross for him to rest upon. And all of this was for Herod. Imagine that. This newly born king was born so that he could save this crazed tyrant who would soon seek this baby king's life and hold the blood of children on his hands. And he was for the scribes and the Pharisees, too, who had lost their way and found themselves scrambling up a never-ending ladder of works righteousness. He was for those wise men as well, those Chaldean foreigners who had no business in Bethlehem, no right searching for a foreign king, no place within that understood religious order of the day. Here is this two-year-old king who had come to rule with grace and mercy and forgiveness and life over each and every single person in our text for tonight. The thing about our God, our Christ, our Jesus, our King, is that He's nothing like we would expect Him to be. Drop all of your preconceived notions that God desires to be your King so that He can spend the rest of eternity being waited on hand and foot For God knows what it is to be a king, a true king. And that means he is the one who serves. A king, a true king, a godly king is a type of king that looks nothing like kings. He looks like a servant, a bloody and broken, sacrificed servant. God is the king who's come to his people because his people need saving. And he doesn't expect them to do it for themselves. He knows that they can't, knows that they never will. And what's more, he knows that when he comes to save them, they will all despise him for it. Fine. He comes nonetheless. Little baby king in a manger. And little child king running around the streets of Nazareth. And grown-up king healing lepers and eating with prostitutes and tax collectors and crucified king strung up on a cross and dead king placed in a tomb and resurrected king with the scars of salvation forever embedded into his servant hands and feet. Ascended king still serving, still saving, still forgiving and washing and feeding even to this very day. And so that brings us all here to all of us who've come tonight, to all of us who come on Sunday mornings. Jesus is your king, and he is for you. And the season of Epiphany is for you. The gifts of the Christ child, which are Christ himself, they are for you. As our Old Testament reading told us this evening, all nations shall come to his light and and kings to the brightness of his rising. Jesus is for all. He is for the world. There's no distinction, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, it makes no difference. Jesus is a servant king for sinners. 
And so we come to worship him, just like the wise men did those thousands of years ago. We worship him along with the angels in the heavens and the great multitude of the saints who have gone before us. We sing a song of praise to our king, but not just because he is our king, but because as our king, he is our servant. As our king, he is our savior. Yes, we have a king, but more than that, we have a king who would lay down his life for the salvation of his people. So number yourselves with whomever you would like in our text for this evening. Chief priest or scribe, Herod or the wise men, it doesn't matter. They're all sinners in need of saving And at some point along the way, we've been all of them. And at some point along the way, we will be all of them again. Like I said, none of that matters. What does matter is that at every single point along the way, this epiphany Jesus is a king whose chief kingly duty is to serve and to save sinners, which means that Jesus is a king for you. In the name of Jesus.